So this week, we are going to take a look at sections 4.4 and 4.5. Okay, so 4.4 will be today, 4.5 part 1 will be tomorrow, and 4.5 part 2 will be on Wednesday. And that's it for this week. So just 4.4 and 4.5. Alright, 4.4 uh, is what we, is all about scatter plots. Does anybody know anything about like a scatter plot, or has anyone ever made scatter plots? Yeah, I've done this before in the past. Yeah, last year. You've done scatter plots yes. before. Okay. Yeah. It's really like you have multiple points on multiple um, multiple areas of, of the graph. Yeah, it looks like we've got multiple points, so it does look like um, a picture of dots. Sometimes the dots make like a pattern. Sometimes they don't. Uh, yeah. So all you're trying to do is basically like on a simpler level, like just trying to find the average of every thing and try to draw a line through it. Yeah, we do try to draw a line through it. We'll talk about what that's called. But yeah, a lot of times we do try to fit a line through all the points. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at the um, at the first thing. So what, what is a scatter plot? So on your first blank where it says a scatter plot is a graph that shows a relationship between two data sets. And so that's that's what a scatter plot is really for. It's to try to see a connection between two different sets of data. So let's say you had uh, an example would be how many hours you spend studying for um, a test and the grade that you get. So maybe what I do is I ask everybody, you know, how many minutes did you study? And I use that as a number. And then I look at what did you get for a grade. So my goal might be to figure out, is there a connection between how much time you spent studying and the grade that you got, right? Now there's only nine people in here, so that would be a very big sample. Ideally, I'd like to ask hundreds of people, you know, what did you, how much did you study and what grade did you get? And hopefully if I asked hundreds or even thousands of people, I could get enough data and maybe I would see a pattern or I would see a connection or a relationship. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. We don't know, right? That's what a scatter plot helps us to figure out. So on that first um, line that has a dash in front of it, it says the data sets are graphed, so they are points. You make a picture of points as coordinates or ordered pairs. So in the example that I just gave, x would be like the number of minutes you spent studying, and y would be the grade that you got on the test. So I would just ask each one of you, how, many, how long did you study? I'd write that number down, and then I'd write down what grade you got on the test, and then I'd make a graph of that. Yeah, we can make a graph on paper, or we can also do it on um, the computer. Okay, I think there is one problem on Edge Elastic where you make a scatter plot. But the graph is already there for you. You just have to click where you want the points. As I said before, scatter plots are generally used to show trends or patterns uh, in data. All right, so let's look at an example of a, um, a scatter plot, and I'm going to ask you a few, a few questions about it. Okay, so I think you guys already have this. Yeah. So you've got this scatter plot. Okay, a couple things that you want to make sure you do when you, um, when you have a scatter plot. Well, the first thing is you have to label each axis. So like in my example, it was number of minutes studying and the grade on the test. Uh, in this one, it's about um, different smoothies. How much sugar is in the smoothie and the number of calories. So they're checking to see, does the amount of sugar that you put in the drink affect how many calories are in the drink? That's the question. Right? Now, just based on the way the dots look, does it look like there's a pattern in terms of how much sugar is in it? affecting how many calories are in it. No. No? Mm -hmm. How come? I, 
a pattern would be like it, it could go like one line, one one above, one at the bottom, but it just random here. It's just like no pattern. So the dots look like they're completely just like all mixed up everywhere. It's not like in, in pattern. Okay. Uh, anyone else have other other thoughts? Yeah. I think it's a positive slope because he gets square in the bottom one, the top one he goes. Yeah, there's see a trend there. Yeah, there's a there's a trend to the points. Okay, if they were completely random, they would look kind of like this. Then that's no trend. That's completely random. There's really no way that you can draw a line through it at all. They're all over the place. But in this one, I would say if you were going to try to estimate a line like the best that you could, I would say that that line is pretty close to what what's happening. Right? When you draw a line, you try to make sure that you have equal number of points above the line, below the line, and on the line. You know, the best you can. So it looks like I've got like one, two, three, four points that are above it. it looks like I've got a couple points that are that are touching it. And I've got about one, two, three, four points maybe below it. Right? So that's that's pretty good. But you're right, that is a positive slope. So what do you think that means is happening here? If you wanted to describe what this picture is telling you in terms of how much sugar is in the drink and how many calories are in the drink. What, what statement do you think you could say about it? So if you had to basically summarize this chart and like when you made this chart, and now I'm asking you, okay, so based on this chart, what do you think is happening? What's the connection between the amount of sugar in a drink and the number of calories in the drink? Yeah? Each time the sugar goes up, the calories also goes up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The more sugar that's in the drink, it looks like, in general, the more calories are in the drink. That's basically the conclusion from that chart. And I think that's something they ask us about in, in Part C, but we kind of jumped ahead. So yeah, the more sugar that's in the drink, the more calories are in the drink. In general, you know, there is a, there is a trend going upward. All right, so now let's, let's see if we can answer uh, these questions. So it says the scatter plot shows the amount of grams in sugar in 10 different smoothies. So each dot is a different smoothie, right? That's one that they just asked the store, like, okay, tell me about, you know, the, the strawberry smoothie, how much sugar is in it and how many calories are in it. And then they put that dot right there. Right. So it says how many calories are in the smoothie that contains 56 grams of Sugar. All right, so how would you figure that out? How many calories are in the smoothie that has 56 grams of sugar? Which dot there is the one that's the 56? Yep. The one seven, 270? Yeah, it's the one that's at the 270. I'll just make it, make it a different color. There's no other dot that's at 56 grams of sugar. Looks like there might be a couple at 54, but 56, yep, there's only one dot. And then how did you figure out that that one's at 270? Yeah, so you just, you know, this is 56. And you go up, you go up to the dot that's at 56, and then you go back over this way, and you can see that it's at 270. That's how you read a scattered line. So how many calories are in the smoothie that contains 56 grams of sugar? That's 270. All right, now part B, it's kind of the reverse question. Look at the smoothie that has 320 calories. How many grams of sugar does that one have? Okay. Where's the smoothie that has 320 calories? The top, yeah, it's all the way at the top right. Okay, so here's the smoothie with 320 calories. Now, how would I figure out how many grams of sugar 
or in that one using the chart. Yeah, now you follow it down. So that one has how many grams of sugar? Yep, so that one has 70. And now part C is kind of like the conclusion about what, what you think is happening. So what tends to happen to the number of calories as the number of grams, just scroll down a little bit, increases. So as the amount of sugar goes up, what seems to be happening to the number of calories? It also goes up. It also goes up, yep. So as the sugar increases, the number of calories increases. Calories increases. In general, okay, in general, that's, that's the pattern that we see. Okay, any question on, on that? Okay, and if we have time after, I'll show you some scatter plots that um, that I have that I that I make um, for different people. Um, they actually it's part of like um, part of some data that I have. And I'll, if I have some time, I'll show you guys that after. All right. So next thing, if there is a pattern in the data. Like it looks like the points kind of follow an upward line or a downward line or some kind of line. Okay, that is called a correlation. Okay, so on that blank where it says a correlation is a relationship between data sets. And then on the next line, it says you can use A and you want to fill in this what I underlined in green. You can use a scatter plot to describe the correlation between data. Now, when we look at a scatter plot, there's really three different types of um, patterns that we look for in general. This first one is kind of, this is a very good correlation. These dots are almost in a perfectly straight line. That's about as good as you usually get. Positive yeah. correlation? Yeah, that's called a positive correlation. Okay, so I'm just going to write that. Do you guys already have that written? Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay, so that's a positive correlation. What that means is... As x increases, that means as x goes to the right, y goes up. Okay, that's called a positive correlation. And if you were to draw a line through the dots, it would have a positive slope. Okay, um, what does this next one look like? A yeah, that's a negative correlation. So negative correlation. And what a negative correlation means is if you were to take your points and draw a line through them, it would look like a negative slope. Okay? As the x value goes to the right, the y value is dropping down. Okay? That's called a negative correlation. And again, that's a pretty good one. Okay? The, the points are almost in a perfectly straight line. Okay? And what do you think that one is? Yeah, that's no correlation. Okay, in a no correlation, the pattern of dots is pretty much random, and you can't you can't really draw any line through it. All right. So those are the three types of correlations we'll look at: positive, negative, and no correlation. And I think somebody had said this earlier. You can think of a line with a positive correlation as having a positive slope, goes up to the right, and a negative correlation goes down to the right. Okay, any question on that? Okay. All right, so let's look at example two. Okay, so this one is on the back. 
and it says tell whether the data shows a positive, a negative, or no correlation. No correlation. Yeah, so this is showing you how old somebody is and the number of vehicles that that person has owned in their life. So does it look like there's a any kind of connection between how old somebody is and how many cars they've owned? Not really. Not really. I mean, there and it wouldn't make sense necessarily. I mean, you could you could be you know 50 years old and maybe you've never even owned a car, or you could be 30 years old and you've already owned five different cars. So there isn't a definite correlation, at least based on this data. Um, that we have. So what I would say for that one is, what are the choices? Positive, negative, or no correlation? What do you think you'd put on that one? No correlation. Yeah, there's no correlation. Now, that's a pretty small data set. There's only, does it tell us how many? No, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's only 10 people that they asked. It would be better if you could ask hundreds, thousands, or even millions of people how old they are and how many cars they own. And if you had millions of sets of points, um, that would be better. Then you'd see more data. Right? But based on the data we have, I would say there is no correlation. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, this is a graph that's showing you the average temperature outside and the number of coats that a store sells. So again, this isn't about your opinion. It's not what you think should happen. It's when you look at the data that you have, what does happen. So based on this, does it look like there's a connection between the temperature and how many coats that a store sold? Yeah, based on this data, it looks like there is a connection. A negative correlation. I would say that that's a negative correlation. Yep. So if you had to kind of summarize what that means, like we did with the smoothies, the calories, and the sugar, what would you, what conclusion could you draw looking at that chart? Uh, well, this one's not about age. Oh. There's no age on this graph. Like, less coats are sold, Exactly. That's exactly what this chart is showing. Whether you agree with that or not, that's what this is showing. The warmer that it got, the less coats that the store sold. Yep. Exactly. Okay, so that's a negative correlation. Uh, and how about this one? This shows you how fast you're going in your car, and how long it takes you to stop when you step on the brakes. Does it look like there's a connection here between your speed and how long it takes to stop your car? Yeah. yeah. And I don't, I think, unlike this last one, which you may be able to argue, I don't think you could really argue a lot about this one. Given the same conditions, same weather, same road conditions, same type of vehicle, if everything else is the same and the car is going faster, it's going to take longer to stop because there's more energy. It's going it's to take longer for it to stop. So what kind of correlation would you say? Positive or negative? Positive. Yeah, this one's positive. Now, you could try to draw a line through it. This one is really more of a curve. Right? We're not going to really get into drawing curves. We would, we would just draw a line the best we could. But I really think that this one is more curved than it is a line. Okay. But there's still a correlation, positive correlation. All right, so now let me ask you a question about it. Um, if a car is going 60 miles per hour, how long, based on this chart, does it take that car to stop? Yeah? Um, 300. 300 
the feet. Yep. So if you're based on the road conditions, the weather, this vehicle, 60 miles an hour, it's going to take the car 300 feet to, to stop. Yep. How about, uh, let's say if a car was going, let's say it took the car 200 feet to stop. About how fast would the car be going? Uh, so in between, I'd say probably about 45, okay? You have to estimate this time where you think it is because there isn't a dot at 200. So if that was your, your curve, I would say 200 gets you right there, and then you go straight down. What we did there is we took a guess. We didn't have a point where we needed it. So there's a fancy word for that, which I think we'll talk about tomorrow. But we basically, we took a guess, and it's about 45 miles an hour. Yep. Okay, so let's look at this one. Uh, example three. It says, make a scatter plot of the data and tell whether there is a positive, negative, or no correlation. All right, now, before we even make the scatter plot, based on what you think, do you think that there's a connection between how old a car is and how much it's worth? Just a regular car, not, not, like, a, not like a special antique car or anything, but just like how old a car is, and what its value is. Do you think there's a connection? Yeah. It'll just it'll go down. Yeah, I would say if it's not a special car, like an antique car or anything, most likely, like if you bought a car and you went to bring it back to trade it in, the longer you wait to trade your car in, the less money it's probably going to be worth because you have more miles on it, gets older, things like that. Well, Sometimes the older cars could be more expensive. Right, if it's like in a special case, like an antique car or a collectible thing, it could be, yeah. So what we're going to see is based on this data, what happens? Okay. So we're going to make a scatter plot. Uh, you guys already have like a small graph you can make your scatter plot on. Now, what does it say the x-axis should be? What are we going to put along the x-axis? And what do those one through eight? What do those numbers represent? Yep, the age of the car in years. Yep. And what are we going to put on the y-axis? The value. The value. Now, what's the highest value we have to go up to? We've got to go up to a twenty-four. And remember, that's in thousands. That's really like twenty-four thousand, twenty-one thousand, and so on. Do we have 24 lines on our no. on our grid? No. no. How many do we have? Yeah, well, if you count this bottom one, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we got nine. So we can't go by ones. We run out of space. So what could we go by that we would have enough room to get all the way to 24 by the time we got up there? Yeah, we go by fours, I think, would work. Might even be able to do threes. I think we'd have enough room. So three, six, 12, 15, 18, 21, just exactly enough to get to 24. Okay, and remember, you have to put a label here. If you don't put a label, somebody looking at this has no idea what 0 through 24 means. It's the value of the car in thousands. So it's the value in thousands. 3,000, 6,000, 12,000, so on. Okay, and we need 1 through 8 on the x-axis. You can just do... Do we have enough room to just go by once? Yeah. Yeah, I think we do. Zero through eight. And what do the numbers zero through eight on the x-axis mean? Age of car. Yeah, this is the age of the car in what? Years. Years. 
Okay. So now we've got our axes labeled, and now we're going to make a scatter plot um, of the data. So I'll do the first point with you, and then I'll let you guys do the rest. So for our first point, um, what's the first x value? One. One. And what's the first y value? Twenty-four. Yeah. So one, twenty-four, and then you're gonna put a dot right there. Okay. So you guys finish um, the next seven points. Uh, make your scatter plot, and then we'll answer the question if we think it shows a positive, negative, or no correlation. Okay, so let's look at our next point. Um, uh, Marie, what's the next point on the um, scatter plot? Uh, thank you. Yeah, what is it? Can you say it again? <coughs> like you go up, you go to the two. Yeah. Like the X and then 21. Yep, so 221. Okay, that's our next point. Uh, Molly, how about the next one? Uh, you go up. So like, uh, so can you give me um, what it would be as a coordinate first. Like 319. 319, yep. So we're going to go 3, and then like you said, a little bit above 18. We'll just estimate the best we can. On uh, Edge Elastic for the test, you won't really have to estimate. It'll, it'll, the numbers will be nice. All right. Uh, Madeline, what's our next one? Uh, 418. So 418. All right. Um, Zach, my next one. It'll be five fifteen. Five fifteen. Okay, so right about here. Uh, Evelyn, the next one after that. Six twelve. Okay, so that one lands on a nice spot. Um, Lily, how about uh, the next one after six twelve? Seven eight. So seven eight. All right, I got to estimate that one. A little bit below nine. And Eric, my last one? Um, eight and seven. Eight and seven, so right about here. All right, so make a scatter plot. Okay, we did that. Tell whether the data shows a positive, negative, or no correlation. Good. What do you think? Negative. Yeah. I'd say it's definitely a negative correlation. Negative. Correlation. And what does that mean? So now if you had to tell somebody looking at this data in general, what what does this chart tell you? About the values going down of the car. Can you be a little the value goes down as the years go by? Exactly. As as the years go by, as as time goes on, the value of the car is dropping. Again, whether you agree or don't agree with that, that's not really the question. It's what does the data show you? Okay. Now, how many points did we have in that scatter plot? Yeah, we only had eight points, so it's not it's not that many. Um, if we were looking at a particular car, like maybe if we were looking at like Toyota uh, Corollas, we might want to do this. Maybe this is for one specific car, what its value was, but we might want to look at maybe. 100,000 Corollas over time and see what happens to all the values and see if we see a similar pattern. And if you see a pattern with that much data, that's, that's, a better, that's a better indication of what's really happening. That's not a lot of data here. All right, so when data shows a correlation, okay? So I'm gonna list out four steps in a minute. I think you guys have blanks for these steps. But when data shows some type of correlation, you can try to draw what we call a line of fit. Okay, a line of fit is basically like a prediction of what the points look like. So if I go back to the one we just did, if I were to draw a line of fit for this one, without doing any math, purely just doing it the best that I can by by I, I mean, would that be a good line of fit? No. no, that's too low. Every single point is above it, and if I did a line of fit like that, that's too high. So probably, you know, let's say 
maybe about like that. I've got one, two, three, four points I could say are definitely right on the line. I got two below, and I got one above. It's probably about as, as good as we can do. Okay. There was no math involved in drawing that line. Okay, so it's just called a line of fit. On either Wednesday or Thursday, I'm going to show you, maybe it's tomorrow, I'll, I'll double check, but I'm going to show you how you can find what's called a line of best fit. It's not a line that you estimate by hand. It's a line that the calculator gives you, and it finds the slope, and it finds the y-intercept of the best line that goes through those dots. We don't learn how the calculator finds it. I just want to show you the buttons you can press to do. Okay, so we'll learn that at some point. All right, so how do we do it by, by hand? Well, the first thing you need to do is, if you want to make a line of best fit, you need to make a scatter plot of your data. Because if you make a scatter plot and it doesn't look like the points make a pattern, you're not even going to draw a line. So step one is to make, make a scatter plot of the data. Step two, what I just said, decide whether you can model the data with a line. So if your points look something like this, do you think you could draw a line through those points? Maybe. Not, not through all of them. But... Well, not through all of them, but do you think they, most of them follow like a, like a pattern? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they go, they go kind of up and to the right. You know, so if I was going to put a line, I would go like that. Now, if I had points like this, does it look like those dots have a pattern? No. no, not really. So I would, in step two here, I would say, no, I can't even model that data with a line. Now, let's look at one more thing. Let's look at those points in red. First question is, do those points in red look like they have a pattern to them? Yeah, they have a pattern to them. Does the pattern look like it's a line? No. No, that's a curve. So in step two here, I would still say, no, the data can't be modeled with a line. It doesn't mean there isn't a pattern. It's just, in this case, the pattern is a curve. That's a little bit more complicated than we get into. Okay, so we're only looking for patterns that are lines. Okay, so step three. It says draw a line that appears to fit the data as closely as you can. Now, this isn't like a definite rule, but in general, you should have about as many points above the line as you do below. Okay, so let's check this one that I did in black. I would say there's one, two, three, four, maybe five points definitely above the line, and one, two, three, four points below. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So when you draw this line, if you are doing it by hand, like on a, a piece of paper, um, you want to probably use, um, you know, use your ID or use something that you can draw a straight line with. Okay, on Edge Elastic, you won't have to worry because it'll draw a straight line for you automatically. Okay, and now step four is once we, once we draw a line, we want to actually find the equation of it. What are the two things that you generally need to find when you write the equation of a line? You need to find the, the, slope. the slope, and you need to find 
The Y intercept. The Y intercept, exactly. So that's what we're going to find. All right, so it says write an equation using two points on the line. The points do not have to be from the original data. They just have to be two points that are on the line you drew. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that in the, um, maybe from the last one that we did. So let's say I wanted to find the equation of that line. I see two points that are right on the line. These two points are actually perfect. And they were two points that were in my original data. So if I was going to do step four, I'd probably just use those two points in green. But what that last part is saying is the points don't actually have to be data pairs. You could use that point right there, and you could use that point right there. Were those two red dots in the original data that I just drew? What do you think, Marie? No. No, they weren't. But if I want to use them, I can, because they are on the line that I drew. So the idea is pick two points Preferably that line up right where the grids cross. Then it's easy to see what the point is. So even though I could use these red ones, I wouldn't. Because now I have to estimate. Like, what is that? That's about maybe 16, 16 and a half. That's not a nice number to have to estimate. Like, pick any two points you want that are on your line. They can be original data points, or they can be two points that you do. They just have to be on the line. All right, does everybody have um, the steps one through four? All right, so let's look at this question. So it says the table below shows, and you guys already have the table filled in on yours? Okay, so it shows the weekly sales um, of a DVD and the number of weeks since its release. So it looks like as time goes on, less and less people buy it. Maybe it's more popular when it first comes out, and then over time, less people are interested. It says, write an equation that models the DVD sales as a function of the number of weeks. Oh, here's the sales, and here's the number of weeks. So to find an equation, what's the first thing we have to make to decide if we should even be writing equation. What do we have to make first? Graph. Yeah, we have to make the graph. We have to make a scatter plot and decide can we even model this data with a line? Okay. Alright, so you guys have a um, graph, blank graph. It's already labeled for you. Okay. The weeks are the x-axis and the sales in millions of dollars are the y-axis. So go ahead and plot those eight points on that graph. And then just call one of us over to, to check it out. And what we'll do is we'll draw the line together through the points. That way we all have the same line. Okay, but just, just do the points for now. Yeah. You ready? Okay, let, it, let me kind of take a look. Okay. All right, so let's do our, uh, let's do our scatter plot. All right, Eric, what's my first point on the scatter plot? 119. And what does that represent? When you say 119, what does that mean? It would represent the week, 19% of the um, sales and millions. Right. So the first week that the DVD was released, <clears throat> it sold $19 million worth of copies. So 119. Yep. Hey, um, Molly, what's my next one? So two. 15, 
a little bit easier to interpret this time because the y-axis goes by twos. So you're either on the axis or exactly in the middle for every one of these. Okay. Uh, Marie, what's the next one? Uh, three. Thirteen. Thirteen. So at week three, the DVD sold, the, the movie sold 13 million copies. Okay. Uh, Madeline, the next one? Four, eleven. So four, eleven. Okay, you got that one. Um, Evelyn, what's the next one? Five ten. Five ten. So not as much of a drop there. It was going down more, and then it didn't go down as much in week five. Um, Zach, what's the next one? Six eight. Six eight. All right, that looks like more of a drop, more like the pattern it was doing before. Um, okay, Lily, the next one. Seven, seven, seven. Okay, so seven, seven. Week seven, the DVD sold seven million dollars. And Eric, uh, the last one. Eight and five, or five and eight. Uh, which way? Eight five or five eight? Eight five. Eight five. Yeah. So eight five, and there we go. All right. So there's our scattered plot. Okay. Any question on that? All right. Now let's make um, let's make the line together. That way we all have uh, the same line. Because if we all did it on our own, we all might have a little bit different line. Um, all right, so the only point that really messes us up a little bit is this top one, right? Every other one of them is almost, almost in a perfectly straight line. So what I'm going to do is if that top one wasn't there, I would do this. And I'd say that'd be pretty good. 18. But that top one, yeah, I'd say it's going to pull it. we gotta, we got to have the line pull towards that a little bit. So maybe, maybe almost like 18 and a half. Uh, wouldn't that be 19? Uh, yeah, you're right. That'd be about 19. Yeah, that's almost 19, it looks like. Yeah. It's just that top one. It's, you almost think of this as like this top one has like gravity, right? Like a planet. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pull it just a little bit. And then the best point I picked was on 7 and 7. It's only when they're actually on the top of the line. Yeah, so now we got to find two points that look like they're exactly on the line. Which um, is seven and seven. I would say seven seven is a good one. And that's so the only one that's actually on the line. Is there any other one that looks pretty close to being right on the line that would be easy? I mean, yeah, two and fifteen. Seven seven. Two and fifteen is the closest. Yeah. Two fifteen. So that's the red one. So it's a little above it. Is there any other point? Remember, it doesn't have to be one of the red dots. It can be anywhere. On the black line. Oh, on um, 12 and 4, 4 12. 4 12. That one's really close. I actually see one even closer than 4 12. Uh, 3 14. 3 14. That one's also really, oh, really close. 9 and 4. Yeah, I think 9 and 4. That one's even closer. That's not a data point we were given, but it is on the line, so we can use it. Yep. Okay, so we're going to use those two points in blue to find the slope and the y-intercept. Well, actually, we can kind of estimate. The y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. Yeah, I'd say that's about, I mean, it's pretty close to 19. So let's, let's go with that. Okay, so the y-intercept is 19. And what letter is that in the um, y equals mx plus b? B. That's the b. And we still need which letter? Um, m, and that's the slope. slope. Okay, so let's find the slope of that line. Does anybody remember what the formula for slope is? Rise over run. Yep, rise over run, which is y2 y two minus y1 x2 x minus x1. Perfect. And now our two points are 7, 7 and 9, 4. So I would call this like x1, y1, x2, y2. All right, let's do it up. Okay, what's the, uh, what's y2? 4. 
So that's going to be four. What's y1? Seven. Seven. What's x2? Nine. That's nine. And x1 is seven. Okay, what's four minus seven? Negative three. Negative three. Over. And what's nine minus seven? Yeah. Three. Uh, two. No, two. No. Wait. Okay. Two. Oh, I see. Okay. So, and what is that? Negative three over two. That's my slope. Okay. So now, take a second on your own and see if you can write the equation of the line in y equals mx plus b. And then the last part, once you write that, is it says to interpret. In other words, explain what the slope means in the problem and explain what the y-intercept means. So each of those two numbers, the slope and the y-intercept, have a meaning in terms of the week and the DVD sales. We have to explain what the two numbers mean. Okay, but write the equation first and we'll see if we can figure out what they mean um, together. Okay. All right, so what's the, um, what's the equation that we use when we're writing on the line? I know, actually, we use a couple, but what's, what's the most common one we use? Y equals mx plus b. Yep, y equals mx plus b. And just a reminder again, what's that down? Slope. It's the slope. And what's the b? Y intercept. Y intercept. Okay, so y equals... What did we get for a slope? And yeah, what did we get for a slope? Yeah, we got negative 3 over 2. And what goes next to it? X. And what did we get for a Y intercept? Plus 19. Plus 19. So that's fine. Or what's negative 3 divided by 2? Yeah, we could also write it as negative 1.5. You know, we normally don't write slope as, um, as a decimal, but in this case, I think it'll help you to figure out what's going on. Now, they're asking you what does the slope and what does the y-intercept mean? Let's start with the y-intercept. I have an arrow pointing to where the y-intercept is. It's about, about right here. What does this point mean on the graph? If you explain it in terms of weeks and sales. So, so that's looking at the pattern of, of all of them. Yes, the sales drop over time. But what does this point in particular mean? Just that one point. There was $19 million of sales when? Like the first week? Yeah, week zero. So that's like the beginning. Maybe, maybe this is the sales after week one, after week two, after week three. Week zero would be the start. Okay, that's just what they call it. That's the beginning. So $19 million was the initial sales of this DVD. The very first, like the first week that it came out. Okay, so that's the y-intercept. So let's write that down. So the y-intercept tells you that at week zero, which is kind of weird. Usually we call the first week week one. They're calling it week zero. It's okay. But the y-intercept tells you that at week zero, the sales were... 19 million. So week zero, this is like start. It's the first week that you could buy the movie. 
on DVD. And that week that it came out, the sales were 19 million. Okay, that's what the Y intercept tells you. Now the slope. What is what is the slope? And what, as a decimal, what was it? Nope, that's the y-intercept. Negative 1.5. What do you think that number means in this problem? Negative 1.5. It's the slope, but how about if you connect it in with week and the sales of the DVD in millions? What do you think negative 1.5 means? Exactly. That's the average amount that the sales go down each week. Perfect. The sales are going down. Now they're not going down $1.5. They're going down $1.5 each week. So that's how much it drops every week. Perfect. That's exactly what the slope means. So the slope tells you that on average, this is not right okay, on average, it's not a guarantee, but on average, the sales drop, because it's a negative number, the sales drop 1.5 million dollars each week. Now, could the sales keep dropping 1.5 million forever? No. Eventually, what would happen? It's gonna no more money. Uh, well, there's yeah, there's no more money coming in from the sale of the DVD, so the lowest it could go is what? Zero. Yeah, zero would mean nobody's buying the movie anymore. Maybe it's you know two or three years old at this point, and it's just nobody buys it. It was on it. Was this is on a DVD, so nobody uses DVDs anymore. Exactly. Yes. So the slope tells you how much the sales are dropping each week. Yeah. Okay. So any question on that one? Right, so that's 4.4. Okay, so that's scatter points. Um, so again, this is the first week for quarter three. And the homework Oh, there you go. The homework is the 4.4 worksheet. And Thursday is a review day.